people. And, um, and, and the students take you know, certain parts and then join the program. But today we are gonna focus this webinar mainly on the residential experience. And as I said before, this residential experience is uh, 10 months. And now we are still you know, working together with the online experience as well due to the COVID as we know, but you know, we, we are very uh, hopeful that the, the, the things, the context is gonna change in the future. So to give you also a glimpse of the type of research we do at the center, uh, different initiatives and projects that uh, can vary from digital supply chain transformation, freight transportation, food and retail operations, humanitarian supply chain labs. So we actually have plenty of the people that actually are the, the founders of these concepts, right? The humanitarian supply chain lab started at MIT almost 10 years ago or more. Digital supply chain, supply chain transformation started just very recently, uh, uh, last year or, or two years ago. The mega city logistics lab working with large urban areas, sustainable logistics initiative, and also sustainable supply chains, like all the different initiatives we have on, on sustainability, working you know, from transparency up to carbon emissions reduction in transportation and, and different other initiatives. And of course, also the visualization lab, the, the cave lab, we call it, in which also we use a, a interesting decision theater with uh, top-notch technology to help decision makers to make, to make better decisions. And, and different things, now plenty of work that also uh, Professor Yossi Sheffi, the director of the center has done in different topics uh, with, with his books. And recently just launched the Abnormal, the new Abnormal, the book that deals with a supply chain now in the context of COVID-19. So all of these, the, the interesting part is that all this research is, is mainly done with the industry. 95% of the funds are actually coming from the industry. And this is also the way that we validate whether this research is relevant or not. If we have someone that is actually willing to pay for it. Now, using these initiatives, we actually offer a very innovative curriculum, right? And this is how it works in the, in, the, in the supply chain management program. So we have plenty of these researchers teaching these courses actually at MIT, uh, which is really uh, something special that at least in my experience, I have never seen in any other university that just in a matter of six months, one year that you are developing a new project or a new initiative, you are able to actually create a new course so that the students in our program can actually take it and get what is at this point, something that will shape the future of the field in, in, in five, 10 years. Now, uh, CTL is, is, is bigger than just the influence we create with the SEM program and also at the, at, at the center with the research much more. We actually are, uh, CTL is the, is the headquarters of something bigger that is the uh, SCALE network. The SCALE stands for Supply Chain and Logistics Excellence and refers to the most important network of centers of excellence in logistics and supply chain management. And we have uh, centers, uh, of course, MIT CTL is a, is a headquarters, but we have also CLI, Center for Latin American Logistics Innovation in Bogota, Colombia. We have a center uh, with the University of Luxembourg. We have the Zaragoza Logistics Center. We have NIMBO. Uh, we have also Malaysia Institute for Supply Chain Innovation. So all these centers are in a way a, a, a replica of what uh, CTL does. And they also offer their own research agenda very much aligned with what uh, are the needs of the region. But at the same time, they also have an educational program that also offers the, the, the degree of supply chain management. And the students actually come uh, when travel is permitted uh, to MIT to take part of uh, the Scale Connect and the different scale experiences. And this is something that even though uh, this year we are gonna uh, do it in a more innovative and, and an interesting way, given the circumstances, you know, in the past, the uh, students will, will come, uh, we will have different, uh, uh, sorry, different uh, uh, interesting activities. This is part of uh, some videos that actually the students from uh, uh, this January, the last class, they did about the experience they had, you know, sharing with different classmates of different regions, the uh, case studies, challenges, and, and different, different experiences. Now, of course, this is not allowed to have so many people in the same room. But uh, things may change in the future, and then we will, we will start gathering again and, and, and trying to have uh, interesting experience uh, like, like this one that I'm showing in these videos. Now, uh, ACM program, uh, as you know, ACM program has been here for over 20 years now, always, you know, at the forefront of the supply chain education. And uh, this is just a very nice uh, gathering, a picture uh, with, with all the alumni. Uh, that actually came, some of them, to celebrate the 20-year anniversary 
and was actually the same time that uh, uh, previous uh, uh, director, executive director, Bruce Arnson uh, left. And then this was the time that I also took over. So interesting times that he decided, being an expert on resilience, he decided to leave exactly the time that the pandemic just hit, right? So I always think that this was a very convenient move, but very interesting times, right? With very, very great uh, opportunities. So uh, uh, now let me, let me just hand it to you, Robert, so that you can uh, tell a little bit more how we are uh, handling uh, this response to the to the COVID nineteen with educational program. Yeah, we thought it was timely uh, to at least address the elephant in the room. Obviously, there's been lots of changes with um, COVID nineteen, and MIT adapted as well. Um, so we just thought it would be important to highlight a few things that MIT has done um, as they reopened. Um, they've obviously done a phased approach for reopening, um, focusing on research. Um, the research ramp up has been pretty steady. I think now they're at 50% capacity. So they've been opening it up over the, um, the summer and now into the fall. Obviously we've invited graduate students back to campus, um, more limited undergrads. And then we have now staff um, on campus as well. MIT's testing has been um, extraordinary. I think they've had over 100,000 tests since August um, and have kept it very low. So. Um, I think even the vice president of research said MIT is probably one of the safest places you can be in Massachusetts just because of our, um, our measures in place. Um, but for those classes that we do have, obviously we have a lot of um, uh, social distancing and mask wearing, but also hybrid um, classes are offered. So students who are, weren't able to make it or have um, other obligations, we have the ability for them to take classes in a hybrid mode. Um, we're expecting to continue that through the spring um, with classes continuing to be both online and on campus. Um, but again, we're still gonna have limited travel options um, and limited events. Um, but all of you are applying for, would be applying for 2022. So obviously we'll see um, what the next year brings. Um, as Jose mentioned, we have to adapt each year um, to each year to the, to the circumstances. Um, but in terms of MIT, in terms of our SCM students, we thought it would be nice to just show a few pictures of how our students have adapted. Obviously our orientation was done um, virtually um, as MIT had a one week of quarantine as students came to campus. So we had our, um, our first gatherings online. Um, and then once we did arrive to campus, we have um, our own space, a very nicely done, um, lots of space for students to social distance and get that in-person experience, which I think um, some of our, uh, our guest speakers will mention at the end how things have gone so far. Excellent, thank you, Robert. Uh, now probably it's a good time to uh, to just introduce you very briefly the the different staff. Uh, it probably is not the time to introduce everyone personally, right? As we said, but at least you can identify that we have a very uh, large team uh, for the forty students of the residential and also the forty students for the blended that, that joined the program. Uh, as I said, I'm, I, I'm I'm in charge of the SEM, but specifically I work very closely with the residential. Uh, a program and the Maria, Dr. Maria Jesus Science, uh, she runs the blended program. The one that I explained goes through the MicroMasters and then later students join uh, for the uh, one semester experience in the spring. Uh, we have uh, uh, Len Morrison, who is uh, uh, the, the expert in, in career development. Uh, so it's our officer or manager that works very closely with the students together also with Justin, uh, Justin Snow. Uh, to to really help uh, create a you know uh, build first all the, the the skills that you guys need to really succeed in terms of connecting with the with the companies uh, succeeding in the in the interviews uh, getting all the the networking necessary uh, different things related to just even writing your resume uh, properly and different things so Len uh, has been extremely successful and we will show you some of the numbers but just to to let you know. Uh, last year, uh, just in December, you know, the first semester already, 70% uh, of the students uh, were already with a job offer, right? Uh, and this year we are actually going also very, very good, even though COVID has hit, it seems still that companies require a lot uh, of supply chain experts. It makes total sense because now people are realizing how important was supply chain when suddenly, you know, they're, they couldn't access to goods, basic goods as just even toilet paper or other things. So uh, we have also plenty of other people, Aaron already, uh, who already texted me, he cannot unmute at this, at this point. 
Uh, if you later can do it during the call, Aaron, uh, you can also introduce yourself. But Aaron is the program uh, manager of both SEM and Scale and helps a lot with the logistics. Uh, Robert Cummings, academic administrator of, of the SEM program. And we have uh, also uh, Bonnie, the communicator, communications officer and marketing. Uh, Mark Colvin, he's the academic manager for all the other scale programs. Uh, so you may also hear from him if you are also interested in applying for programs that are in other scale centers. And also we have a group of uh, research staff, uh, mainly postdoctoral researchers that work also supporting teaching activities and also supervising uh, thesis and capstan projects, Dr. Jan Sutayaxi, Dr. Nima Kazemi, and also Dr. Olsen uh, Tosanli, right? So just to show you, this is the staff for the SEM program. We have a still, you know, research staff from CTL and instructors that uh, also are part of the group, but this is the one that uh, is part of, uh, of, of, of the SEM and will be closely related with those that are also taking part of the, of the class, of the class of uh, 2022. Now let's go for a program overview. And uh, let me just uh, start with this um, description of the journey. And uh, in the journey, as we said, we start usually an onboarding session that happens in some moment between March and July, once we com have completed the, the admission process and the selection of the of the class and then we start with orientation and if again the uh, uh, weather permits and COVID permits we we usually go to an island in thompson thompson island in, in boston and the students have some team building activities you know different things related to also facing their convictions understanding what, what how to collaborate in a diverse group and things like that this year actually we had a very interesting setting using, using also zoom and and another uh, uh tech-based uh, initiatives and it was it was very well taken by the students and still we got the objective of starting the engagement and uh, helping the students to you know start uh, collaborating for the for the kickoff of the program now after we have this of course in orientation the main thing is we want to make sure that you guys uh, are prepared for you know the their requirements of, of of the master's program mainly taking the exams you know being in the classroom and studying many of you have actually been in the industry maybe for five years, three years, 11 years. And, and what happens is that you, you, don't, you don't get used to do exams. So we help you with that by applying an exam. That creates a little bit of tension. Uh, but as you know, is if you are actually selecting uh, MIT as part of your education, you know that this is going to be challenging. Nobody comes here just to have a nice vacation. But we are going to be with you to help you. Right, and this is this is part of uh, of the work we, we assign you the caps and thesis projects you're going to be working on, and and we have also other type of activities related also to uh, leadership and and etc. Now after this, then the fall starts, and then we have the 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 the, the fall semester, the classes uh, with plenty of activities. The recruitment starts very heavily. You start having your sessions with the with the career uh, uh, officer, uh, land adjusting working with companies, they start coming every week, and then it starts a different dynamics. MIT starts offering plenty of different seminars, webinars, uh, classes become very challenging, but you can actually go more the extra mile. Would you like to take this, the other? And then suddenly you have really plenty of things that uh, it seems, as we say, you are drinking from the fire hose. And this is definitely part of, of the experience. Uh, now, after all of this, then we have the IP scale experience. Uh, we do the research expo. This is our, our, our main event in which our students and also all the other scale students present their, their, their progress in the research projects, caps and thesis. And we actually have a large gathering of executives, uh, different companies, media. You know, in the past, we've, we've been having a, a Wall Street, a supply chain management review, a different uh, important business oriented and also just general media attending these events to really gather the best innovations the students are developing. Uh, that will serve and will shape also the, the, the field. And this is going to be very interesting. This year, we are, we are going to do it. We, are, we, we actually haven't uh, disclosed how the, the calendar looks like. We will do it probably very soon. But we definitely are going to work on this, bringing also people from the Entrepreneurship Center at MIT, helping also our students to develop their, their ideas and plenty of different things. I shouldn't probably elaborate too much because uh, I believe Michelle and Amun are here. But uh, very soon, uh, you guys are going to hear even more that even given the setting of, of the COVID, we still are going to take advantage of that to create even a, a more uh, impactful event, right? That will really reach out plenty, plenty of different people. 
Uh, so now uh, the spring. Uh, the spring now, it, again, uh, it starts, uh, we'll finish January, the IAP, uh, Scale Connect, but then February, May, or June, uh, depending on the context, we are gonna uh, finalize the semester, plenty of different classes related to machine learning, data analytics, supply chain management, all the different electives from the uh, different labs, sustainable logistics, uh, digital supply chain transformation, procurement, uh, urban logistics. So different topics that are pretty much related to what the researchers at the center are, are currently doing. So they, 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 the knowledge you get in those topics are actually, you know, at the forefront of, uh, of, of, the, of the topics of the field that, uh, that we develop. Anyway, so with this, uh, you, when you enter to the program, we have two degree options, right? We still have these options, but we are now honestly disappearing one of the options because this is not uh, the essence of the program, even though we still, we still have it. Two options are, we offer the Master of Applied Science in Supply Chain Management, and we have the Master of Engineering in Supply Chain Management. So what is the difference? Minor differences. Uh, the, the main one is in, in, the, in the Master of Applied Science, you do a Capstan project. That Capstan, it's uh, sponsored by the industry. So some of the companies that are working uh, with the center, uh, and you know, uh, those companies are PNG or Walmart, Amazon, uh, in the past, Uber, uh, Starbucks, you know, very good companies that are coming to, to, to work with you. And the, and the emphasis is in solving a problem for the industry, building managerial insights, insights using a research oriented approach, but it still is working with the company. Well, in the Master of, of Engineering, you still are required to work with the company, but the emphasis is more in what is economic contribution? What is the research gap? Uh, and that requires more extensive literature review, right? More work related to where I'm gonna find the contribution and requires different, different set of skills. Uh, the important thing here is that one is not better than the other, the, both are different. But the way that we recruit the students, uh, we recruit the students because of your leadership potential, your impact to make change also in the industry or mainly in the industry, we want leaders, right? And this is part of the purpose that will solve the problems of humanity and will have you know, the, the mission of MIT instilling them. Uh, and even though in the other, you, you, you may find, you know, I want to do a research career or academic career, I would like the Master of Engineering. That, that is also another way, but this is not how we are shaping this, right? Still, you guys can select it. If this is the case, you, you're required to do the, the, the thesis, but also take some uh, other more technical courses uh, to, to achieve it, while the other requires more uh, practical uh, type of, of, of courses. So in a nutshell, uh, if you have not, uh, if you're not sure or if you're not convinced, you haven't done research, you haven't published a paper in the past, just go for the Master of Applied Science. That's the one that uh, makes more sense to, to, to all of us. Now, Robert, why don't you uh, explain a little bit more how the curriculum uh, looks like? Uh, yeah, so over the, the nine to 10 months here that the residential students um, pursue the program, <clears throat> MIT has the semester divided, but divided or the year divided into three semesters. Um, so starting with the fall, you can see here that we have six um, core subjects that students will take um, that include analytical methods, so logistic systems, which is going on right now, um, database and data analysis, financial analysis. Um, so this is really the, the core foundational experience in supply chain and logistics um, to get the program started. You'll also be working on your research projects that Josue mentioned, the capstone. Um, so a lot of um, a lot of pre work goes into defining your pro defining your problem, um, your literature review, and getting that first draft ready for the spring. Uh, during this time, you can also choose um, electives. Um, so you'll have the option to do more electives than what's listed here, but usually we recommend at least one. Um, then once we go into the January term, which MIT calls IAP for the Independent Activities Period, um, this four weeks um, is more intensive. Um, so we just have um, two classes listed here. Uh, and then there's more, uh, more involved with your research. Um, so you'll present your projects to your peers, um, do more work with your advisor. Uh, and then you'll learn more as we see here through the Python programming class and through the leading global teams. Um, so in a normal year, we'll have students from all over the scale network join um, here at MIT. This year we'll obviously be um, uh, have some virtual components to that as well. Um, 
And then as we move into the spring, uh, your options open up a little bit. So we have four um, core subjects that you would take in um, data science and machine learning. Um, we have advanced writing um, to fine tune your capstone project um, and get it ready for submission. Um, we also have um, a study, our study treks um, that would usually take place at that time. And then you'll finalize your research project um, and we'll present those to your to your peers. Um, the benefit of the spring is that there's a lot more opportunities for electives. Um, so and through our cur curriculum, we have required electives in analysis, supply chain management, and just management overall. Um, so you'll have a lot of opportunities to select classes, um, particularly in the spring. The total degree requires 90 units, um, but one thing that's beneficial from MIT, um, although it's a challenge for some students, is that um, you actually have unlimited uh, credit um, within reason, within our, our within our advising limits. But um, you do basically have the option to take however many classes you can reasonably manage. Um, there's no additional charge to go beyond that 90 units. Um, I see Jose smiling because we often have to talk students down to make sure that they have a reasonable course load um, because there's so many things offered here at MIT that students want to take everything possible. Um, so it really is um, in your best interest to have a manageable course load, but there's plenty of shopping to, to choose those electives. Um, so we'll work with you during the spring and the fall term to select those courses. Excellent, thank you, Robert. Yeah, indeed, right? The students always want to take a little bit more, but they learn after the fall. Then later in the spring, they are more conservative, which is good. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about the MIT experience. So, uh, Robert, would you like to? Yeah, yeah so <clears throat> we'll do this sort of in two parts. Here we just have some um, iconic images of MIT and um, the experience that we would have here. Obviously, we're located in Cambridge, which is close to Boston, uh, really, really right in the heart of the city. So there's a lot, lot to do. Um, at the end of the webinar, we'll hear more from um, our two, our two student ambassadors, uh, Michelle Roy and the Moon. Um, so we'll be able to get a little bit better, um, better input from them on their experience so far and what they've taken advantage of. And we'll have more opportunities for questions as well. Um, so that's just like a little snippet of uh, the experience at MIT. <laughs> and then um, in terms of, uh, yeah. So in terms of um, what are the key factors that you would use to, to why would you choose the, the SCM residential program? Um, obviously, one of the biggest selling points is that um, you only have to enroll for one year. So compared to an MBA program, which has two years of um, class, ours is only one year, um, so nine to 10 months, um, as I mentioned before, from late August until the end of May. Um, the outcomes are very comparable to MBA programs, so salary outcomes and job opportunities that are really on target with our MBA peers. Uh, we also offer OPT and STEM um, STEM extensions for U.S. work authorization for international students. Um, so that's definitely a big plus. Um, our program is located uh, within the School of Engineering, so we still have a very um, analytical focus to education um, that's very aligned with the School of Engineering's mission. Um, but we still do have a lot of um, close relations with the Sloan School of Management as well. So many students take um, electives at Sloan, um, even though we're um, a part of the engineering school. Um, and then another big selling point is the cohort experience. So we have um, usually a group of 40 students is what we aim for each year. Um, so it really allows you to build those connections um, with your peers. And we rely heavily on our alumni network um, to help with all aspects of the program from um, career preparation, interviewing, um, guest speakers, um, hosting us for visits. So that, that alumni network that we build and that cohort really um, bonds the students together. And then um, one selling feature that, uh, <clears throat> that we'll hope to bring back very soon are our study treks. Um, we have different experiences to Panama, which includes um, visits to pineapple factories, seeing the, lo the locks and transportation in action. Um, so these treks really allow for an experiential learning. Um, so you can see supply chain in action. Um, we vi have visits to the Bay Area, um, Seattle and Portland. Um, in the past, we've also gone to Los Angeles. Um, so it's really to see um, to see our, our, 
our uh, alumni network and how they've um, how they use our supply chain tools in their careers now. So it's always a great opportunity for connections um, and seeing supply chain in action. Excellent, Robert. So let me just comment also uh, uh, some news. Probably some of you have heard and we feel very happy. Uh, the first time that uh, probably the uh, most, if, if not uh, one of the most respected uh, rankings uh, in the QS, uh, did for the first time uh, a ranking for supply chain management programs. And it has actually given us the number one in the position. So we feel super happy. And of course, this is an acknowledgement for all the great uh, work of the staff and Robert and the rest of the researchers. And of course, mainly the students, the billion students like those that are gonna speak very soon with you, uh, Michelle and Amun. But uh, yeah, very happy to share also this great news with you, uh, giving also the context, uh, the program seems to be a growing reputation and mainly because of the great emphasis we are putting on machine learning, data analytics, you know, like tech base, you know, those, those digitalization topics are really putting us at the, at the forefront in a way, because it, for us, uh, as, as I said before, we received these signals from the industry two years ago and exactly at the moment we finish on the Arnold Partner meeting, you know, every year we meet with all the companies to take a look at the curriculum. They made those recommendations and the next six months we were already with the changes in the curriculum offering these, these courses. And if there are new things like now, and probably this is a good time also to mention it, uh, given also the COVID, we are now uh, launching a new course uh, of COVID. I'm calling at this point the COVID and the effect in the supply chain, but very likely we're gonna change it more related to responsive responsiveness in COVID uh, context for supply chain or something like that. But that course that we are now working on it, uh, I'm working this with Professor Sheffi who just wrote the book and also taking the research that different uh, um, uh, staff from the center has been working on this, this month. We are gonna put a course for the students to take during the spring. And of course, uh, when, when the new class will join, we hope that this course either will be still relevant or we will shape it for another topic that by then will be also relevant for you to know how to be better prepared. So uh, let me just hand it back to you, Robert, uh, for the professional development. Yeah, so one of, <clears throat> as you mentioned, one of our big highlights is really our, um, our um, high touch job placement and career development services. Um, offered by our, our, our coworkers, Len and Justin. Um, so it was worth um, showing a slide here on all of the things that they do and sort of the career preparation offered. Uh, <clears throat> so obviously that includes um, detailed prep for resume and cover letter reviews um, it, during orientation and even all the way up until um, our onboarding process that takes place over the summer. You'll, they'll, Len and Justin offer many webinars um, to develop your resume and to start preparing for that career outlook. Um, they offer lots of interviews with um, current alumni and guest speakers on how they've how they've um, man navigated their career. We also have an, a, an assessment based on your talents, so you can really um, get a deeper look at to what your strengths are and how you can play to those and how to improve on um, your areas of weakness. Um, individual career coaching is obviously a big part as well. Um, Len and Justin are here. Actually, I just saw them yesterday. So they, they are still conducting those interviews in person or virtual. Um, obviously, we have to adapt um, this year because uh, eventually you'll still need to use those, um, those tools. Um, and then the companies that we get to participate, a wide range from um, companies on the West Coast, but also getting um, positions from all over the, the world usually. Um, we've had positions for international as well. Um, information sessions, resume drops. Um, I know the, the the biggest time of the year for recruiting is really in the fall, um, so September and October. Um, so we usually advise students to be prepared um, to take advantage of that, that now. <clears throat> um, and like I said, we'll have job postings um, and continue professional development series. So I think um, in the fall we have um, communications, in the spring we have public speaking, and then um, in January, we have more leadership workshops um, because what we're really trying to do is build supply chain leaders um, that will be able to elevate you in your career um, and further advance. So that's why the, the leadership component is a big part uh, for us. 
Uh, and then in terms of, um, this is just a snapshot of some of the employee of the employers that we've had last year and some of the positions that our students go on um, to get. So as you can see here, lots of senior positions, both in supply chain planning, um, program development, uh, procurement, and at some of the, the top companies um, here in the US um, and even abroad. So um, I think this is a good, a good snapshot of um, where our students go. And you can see here how um, we end up leveraging this network um, to, to find positions for future years and also for um, visits and guest speakers that we have throughout the year. Um, yeah, and then next I'll just jump through to the application process. So I think this is um, probably one of the areas that most people want to know about is basically an overview of the application and um, what we're looking for. So first, just covering here the, um, the stated requirements. Um, we have our GMAT GRE, or as we offer a waiver through the SC0X. So um, we, this year, obviously there's been a lot of um, changes due to COVID-19 and the ability to take the GRE or GMAT. Um, so we have always offered um, for the step for several years, the ability to take our MicroMasters um, course SC0X in supply chain analytics. Um, we definitely feel that this is a good opportunity for you to learn uh, relevant information that can be applied to the program. So we've offered this waiver, I think for three years now. Um, so if you're not able to take the GRE or GMAT, um, definitely consider this option. Um, it'll be, the course will be running um, through through the winter, so you can still apply for uh, round three if you start taking the course now. Um, if not, you can still take the GRE or GMAT. We know both of those offer at home versions, so that's definitely an option um, that we'll take this year. Um, but it is still an important um, requirement that helps us uh, assess your skills. Uh, for non-native English speakers, um, we still recommend taking the IELTS or TOEFL. Again, uh, the at home version of, um, of this test is fine. Um, we are pretty liberal with the use of waivers. So if you've um, taken a, if you've had a degree at an English speaking university, either undergrad or masters, um, we'll definitely take those into consideration as meeting the requirement and you can request that waiver within the online application. Uh, the resume and CV also is a major component. Um, we wanna see the, your work experience. Um, as you know from our application, we do require at least two years of work experience. So make sure that that is highlighted in your resume um, and incorporated um, in your statement of objective. Uh, transcripts are also important. We wanna see your the, the grades that you've gotten um, at the undergrad level and what sort of classes you've taken. Uh, we don't have any required majors, so you don't need to have like a major in supply chain or management. We have a broad um, overview. I think around half of the incoming students have um, engineering backgrounds actually, um, and then a lot from business and management, but also every now and then we do get um, a few from liberal arts and other areas that have really be been able to apply it to supply chain um, or, or have advanced in their career and really wanna make that transition to supply chain or logistics. Finally, we'll have the statement of objectives and the video statement. Um, so these are two different uh, avenues for you to present yourself. The statement of objectives is a more formal written version um, where you can state your goals for the program, what you've done so far that makes you um, a competitive candidate. The video statement takes a more personal approach. Um, so this will have a little tip, some tips on the next slide. So I'll just wait until that point. Um, but then we also have the letters of recommendation, um, which are the final piece of the application. Um, two are required here. They can definitely come from both academic or professional settings, depending on what um, best represents you. Um, so you can um, feel free to make that decision. And we also accept uh, additional letters of recommendation, I believe up to five, but um, no more than that. We just wanna keep it tailored um, uh, to just five, um, but two is only the limit. Um, and then I just have a little snapshot here of our grad apply application system. You'll notice our MIT system is probably different than, or I know it is different than any other system because we created it ourselves. So it's a little more simple, but um, useful for us um, to, to help review your applications. So if you do have any questions on that, all the emails to scm at mit.edu, go to me and I can definitely help um, with our team um, to answer any specific application questions. Um, and as I mentioned, I wanted to cover um, two major tips that are um, that we that we say are the most important for applicants to keep in mind. 
So the first is the video statement. Um, this is really your opportunity to present yourself to the admissions committee. Um, we've changed the requirements just a little bit this year to make it a little shorter um, and make it a little bit more relevant. So as I said, we want it to be that personal introduction of yourself. Um, we're keeping it, we're suggesting to keep it to two minutes long and you can incorporate um, question, um, the questions and the prompts that we have here on why you wanna be admitted, what you'll contribute to the MIT community and then any other information that's relevant um, to the admissions committee that might not be stated on your um, resume or your, or your statement of objective. Um, so it's really about being yourself we definitely want you to avoid reading a script. Um, and you would just use a webcam like I'm using now, your iPhone, um, keep in mind around your settings um, so that we can hear you, see you. Um, Cause we reference those videos a lot to, as um, basically that first, uh, it's basically an interview with you that we can see, um, see your representation. So that's an important piece. Uh, the other important piece is your, res is your work experience and your resume. Um, so as we mentioned, uh, two years is the minimum, but often we're looking for applicants with a little bit more experience um, who are most successful. So three to seven years of, uh, of experience is ideal in roles in supply chain or other areas as well. Um, make sure that it's clearly identified in your resume uh, with the things you've done, the areas that you've worked so that we don't have to do too, mu too much guessing on where you are now and um, what you've done before. I think that always helps out the admissions committee. So those are the major tips there. Um, Robert, can I just comment something very quickly before sure. you go with the, with the application reminders very quickly. So there were there were a couple of things that Robert mentioned that are really relevant and uh, I would like just to stress out those those, those comments. So the first one is about the, the GMAT GRE requirement. Uh, if you guys do the SEC Rex, that's that would be awesome, right? Because you're gonna end up doing it either way. And this is important, right? This is part also of the requirements if you are admitted. Now, this one is related to supply chain management. So we can actually get an assessment with your technical skills related to the field. And, and it's also with us. So that means we are going to know how many hours you are dedicating to this and what were your grades in each of the, of the homework or tasks. You know, those things are relevant as well. So in case of, of doubt, uh, just go for the ACC or X, uh, you know, look at the, the dates and make sure that you get your 95 uh, out of 100 before applying. I'm exaggerating, right? You, if you get 85 above, that's fine. But target, you know, to get as high as possible. That's always good. Second, the video. This is something that we change. I know probably some of you, if you have already applied and you submitted the five minute long, that's okay, right? You don't need to replace it. Uh, the thing is that in the past, we will have exactly the same, like the statement of the objectives uh, will be exactly the same information in the video, right? You will just read it. And, and not you, right? But previous applicants. And, and this, this, you know, is nothing wrong with that, but doesn't add more, right? What we want to assess in the video is more your presence, your communication skills. How do you feel like if Robert just said it in an interview? So show us more about you in that video. That's, that's key, that's important. And, and try to extend additional information always helps. What are the things that you would like the committee to remember once you do the video? Like we, we are done with you, what do you want us to keep in mind about you? So do that in the video and you probably, you know, would be very convincing and we will look at your video. Uh, at least we will enjoy a lot. And this is also important. Uh, so the, the, uh, and definitely don't read the script. Right, like 90% of applicants do that. Uh, it's it's not a good thing. We don't want you to memorize something and say it, you know, very nice, articulated. No, it's more like show yourself, right? And this is important, right? Show yourself uh, uh, with us, with the committee, and and that probably shows more of your personality and, and your communication skills. And the third one with the work experience, Robert already said it, just to emphasize, uh, we want that like between three and seven, because also this is very relevant for the, for the industry. You know, once we do the outreach to, to find your, your perfect job, in many cases, the industry looks at favorably applications that are, you know, with, uh, with the degree plus from three to seven, right? If you are in the other side, you still can get it, right? It's just that this seems ideal for us, right? But Keep that in mind, if you are in the application and you are a little bit short, you may probably benefit more by working one year more and then applying with us. So keep, keep that in mind. So Robert, I, I give it to you now to, for the reminders for the application. Uh, yeah, so just one um, final slide here on the application reminders. 
Um, so as we mentioned, our next, our first deadline is November 15th. Um, we plan on turning around all of our decisions within three weeks. Um, so those who have taken SC0X in, in the summer and recently finished, you'll be eligible for round one. Um, those of you that are just starting to think about applying now, um, you can still take SC0X and be eligible to apply for round three. Um, yeah, and we always, there's no, um, there's no preferential treatment given to each round. We usually, um, we have spots available at all three. So that's why we've, we've offered three deadlines to really just accommodate your schedule um, so that you can apply when it makes it best sense for you. Yep. And so now I'll finally turn it over to our two student guests, um, Michelle and Namoon, to just give you a little perspective on how they've, um, how the program's been for them, how they, why they chose the program and any other sort of relevant information. And then we'll move on to questions. So why don't I first turn it over to Namoon? <laughs> Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, again, this is Namoon. Um, I am currently a master's in applied science student. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, my background's in um, management consulting. I mostly did procurement and end-to-end -end sourcing from, uh, solutions for our clients. I ended up thinking, wow, you know, there's so much more to the supply chain than just procurement. And I really needed to get a more holistic view of, of the supply chain. Um, and not only that, I realized that um, I wanted to be a, in a place where I was at the cutting edge of the different technologies um, and technological solutions, right, um, in the supply chain space. So that's kind of how I ended up um, looking up MIT and applying and um, thankfully um, getting in. So I'm really thankful to be here and excited to, to continue on to the semester, I would say the first half of the semester. So we're about 25% there. Um, it's been a whirlwind, to be honest. It's been a lot, like Josue said, it is really like drinking from the fire hose, um, but in a good way, right? Because we are here to learn, we are here to, to challenge ourselves. And I think if we aren't being challenged, then, then it wouldn't be a good program. So I'm thankful for that. I think it's, I'm sure Michelle would also agree that um, not just academically, but also in terms of on the personal level too, you know, especially working with Len and Justin, our career counselors, really thinking through um, on a personal level, where, where, where do we want to be? Like what makes us happy? What are our next steps? Um, not, not just in terms of the, the technical aspects and the classes, which are also very challenging. So a really great experience all around. Um, even despite the, the COVID um, situation, I, I think that um, we've, we've been doing really well in terms of connecting with our staff, um, with each other. I think that's the beauty of having a small class, um, just being able to really know each other's names, you know, have those smaller gatherings and um, really also kind of being there for each other during this, these times, because uh, we're really all going through it together. So it's been really fun and challenging. Um, I think those would be the two words that I would, I would uh, use to describe the first half of um, our year. So I let me know if you have any other questions. I think I'm going to turn it over to Michelle because that was a pretty long <laughs> introduction. Um, Michelle? Yes. Um, thanks, Simon. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Michelle Roy. Uh, before coming to MIT, I did uh, an undergrad in supply chain management and then worked for Shell for three and a half years in procurement. Um, Similar to Namoon, I was attracted to this program because of the opportunity to be kind of on the cutting edge of supply chain and, and understand um, what's new and to get to be a part of it. The other piece that I wanted to bring out that Namoon spoke to a little bit is that part of the work experience requirement um, that, that makes the program so valuable is that when you're in the classroom learning from these incredible professors about concepts, you almost always have someone in the room who has uh, worked within that space in real life and can give you a real example about, you know, when they've applied a principle and practice and, you know, examples of when that's gone well and when it hasn't. Um, so it's really just an incredibly rich learning environment um, that I'm, I'm really happy to be a part of. I think I'll, I'll let Robert, maybe if he has some questions or in the chat. <laughs> Excellent. Um, yeah, so we'll just move right into um, questions. I've already started answering a few just written here. 
Um, so what I'll do is um, just start reading them aloud and then doing the doing the my desk to to field the questions to see who they're for. Um, so I already mentioned here, um, we do have the option that applicants could apply to both the residential and blended programs. Um, they're reviewed that the admissions committee reviews those decisions separately. Um, so there's no um, there's no um, uh, downside to applying to both if you're eligible. So definitely take that into consideration. Um, in terms of the level of detail for the resume, I think it's important to highlight the experience that that is most relevant to the field of supply chain um, or just your general leadership um, areas there. Um, that's always helpful, um, but still keep it to one or two pages long, um, depending on depending on how long your work history is. If you've only been working for three to seven years, then you shouldn't be going over two pages, at least on um, this application. And once you um, learn from Len, you'll, you'll really fine tune those experiences once you've um, joined the program. Uh, let's see. Uh, so the, in terms of the application process, um, you'll notice that there is the ability to apply to multiple programs. Um, so you have, we have our program here in Cambridge. Um, through the same application, you can select multiple, multiple um, scale centers um, with all with one application. So we have our scale centers in Spain, Luxembourg, Malaysia, um, and China. Um, so you can um, just submit one application there and you'll receive a decision for all of the programs on the same um, date, um, different time zones. So they might be spread out, of course, over a few different hours, but um, we all commit to the same three day, three week turnaround um, of decisions. Uh, on average, what is the percentage of the class who pursue entrepreneurial careers? Um, I don't know the exact percentage. I know <laughs> that that would probably be a question more specific towards um, our career development office. But um, just anecdotally, I know that there's a lot of careers and um, particularly for some of our um, blended students or students that might have more advanced careers, um, they take the entrepreneurial path a little bit more because they have more experience to develop um, their own business idea or go on to positions, um, higher level positions. Um, so that was an earlier question as well as um, what's the average age for the residential program? Um, I believe the average age this year was around 30 years old. Um, so that um, you can keep that in mind. We don't have any, um, any upper limit to experience um, or age, obviously. Um, we do have some applicants who apply with, um, with more background. Um, and in those cases, you might just need to be a little bit more proactive with the job search um, because you would be looking for higher level positions. Um, Oh, sorry, did you have anything? Yeah, just um, very quickly, yeah. Robert. I was going to give a couple of examples. Actually, uh, last week, uh, we got a session with Jeff Silver, which is an alum from the program that is also the founder of Coyote Logistics Company. And uh, by the way, he also is, uh, has to sponsor plenty of research and uh, even a, a, a chair for, for the executive director of the center, Chris Kaplis. Very successful example. We have also Bindiya, uh, who is also the founder of ResiLink. You know, and now she has become even more uh, uh, famous with all the challenges with COVID because she's she this software of Resilink is is, is used plenty to to teach uh, companies executives uh, how to build you know a better supply chain risk management strategy. So there are there are examples of entrepreneurship, but of course uh, uh, this takes time. And uh, we both Robert and I are quite young in the program, so the examples probably we should start tracking down. There are plenty of, uh, of successful uh, alums that uh, are doing plenty of different things, but usually after working for uh, some years in, in the industry, just to just to give that example. And also for the other question, I just wanted to comment. You know, it was like when I said that the three and seven, you know, it's it's easier. Uh, it's 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 it, what I meant is is not restrictions, right? You you may have 12, 15 years of working experience. That's that's awesome. Right. Uh, the question there will be how the program will really, you know, help you, you know, grow in that in that direction. There, there are people that we receive, particularly for the blended. Usually, blender, blended. Correct me, Robert, this number, but blended, in in terms of age, should be like probably four or five years uh, older than the residential students, right? Yeah, that's correct. And uh, and and if that's the in that case, still right. We we have cases in which those that are senior actually finish and they actually hire. You know, residential students, we've seen that as well, or, or uh, and they come and recruit that that's totally fine. You, your contributions is what really matters for the class. And this is what we are going to really assess. 
And in your case, you should probably just think whether the program will really help you in that direction. If you just want to go back and keep working in your industry, or if you would like to achieve something else, this is probably the conversations uh, we should have, right? But, uh, but everyone is, is welcome to apply, no restrictions at all in terms of the, of the working experience, the years of working experience. Yep. Go ahead, Robert, with the most difficult questions for you, please. Yeah, I saw sure. one that was, by the way, an interesting one. I'm sorry to interrupt. That was the, if you uh, ladies can describe uh, a day of uh, at MIT, right? Yeah, I was going to jump right into those questions. Like, what's your what's okay. a day um, of life on campus for you guys, for Michelle and Namoon? Um, yeah, I can I can go ahead. Sure. Um, so I am actually living off campus. And so on a typical day, I have most of the time one, maybe two classes in the morning. And so that's normally how I'll start my day. Um, something that's, I think, a little different about grad school than maybe the undergraduate experience that some of you would have had is that I that I know I had is that I like to keep my my kind of business hours during the day focused on on school and on class. Um, so in between classes, I will either be working often on my capstone project or working on homework or, or meeting with classmates to go through a case study, perhaps. Um, so that's pretty typical. Um, and then probably another class, maybe in the afternoon or evening. Um, I think most of us would say we try to work in time for the gym or a run or something like that. Um, and then we often have in the program opportunity for some kind of um, socially distanced uh, activities together. So an example of that may be, um, you know, going with a group of, you know, three or four classmates to eat dinner. There are a lot of nice uh, patio restaurants in Boston that we've been able to take advantage of. Um, and so that's a pretty Pretty normal day for me right now. Yeah, I, I think for me, I don't really have a typical day. <laughs> um, so I actually came with my family and I have, I have two kids. So it's been um, pretty typical every day, I would say. Um, but generally speaking, um, it's you know, depending on the, 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 the number of classes I have in the day, it's usually two to three hours or sometimes uh, four to five, depending if I have two or, or three courses scheduled for that day. And then the rest of the time would, you know, be divided around, um, like Michelle said, meeting up with classmates to review cases, usually over Zoom sometimes, um, and doing homework, right? Uh, spending about an hour or so a day on recruiting, researching, um, networking with alums and other classmates. Um, and yeah, and so I'd say, and some exercise <laughs> if it could fit in. So that's pretty much on average what it looks like. Um, I would say it does vary for people, like some people do have families, some people don't, some people are working maybe part-time, um, and so everybody has different, you know, priorities, um, and again, different, uh, class loads, so depending on how many credits you're taking to, uh, that could also change a little bit, uh, but I would say it is pretty packed, your week is packed, uh, you are, you know, doing homework over the weekend, um, you are, you know, networking over the weekend. There are activities also over the weekend. So it's really what you make out of it. Um, you can do everything and just have a really, really full schedule, or, you know, you can also uh, ease in to the semester maybe. Uh, I would, I suggest kind of going full in. That's kind of the way um, I do things. So uh, it's been really great for me. I mean, this is what um, I wanted to do. So it's really different for everybody. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Um... Going off of just another sort of loose question that I'll pose to all three of you, um, Josue included, is what um, what sort of initiatives um, have students been involved with? Um, so any sort of um, projects that they we've done either with the center or that you've taken on with yourself. Um, the one that comes to mind um, that I know is in the in the process now is the um, supply chain hackathon. Um, I think that that's been. Um, a project that was done last year and we're continuing it this year. But do you have any other um, comments as well? <laughs> well, you just spoiled the surprise, Robert, for uh, for Namun and Michelle. <laughs> but uh, yes, it's just a joke, Robert, of course. No, <laughs> it's a great example. It's a great example. And we are going to do this, by the way, uh, for this for the spring. So there are different ways, right? And usually, you know, it takes a little bit of time and most of the of the students, at least in my experience, they, they start engaging with the different initiatives and labs at the center in the spring, which is also the time in which we are we are usually giving the, the lectures, like the classes of, of, uh, of our labs. Like in my case, I teach sustainable 
before sustainable supply chain management, now sustainable logistics. Remember the most important class at MIT. And we have also urban logistics, we have digital supply chain transformation, but then lately students, once they are, you know, getting the, uh, like in, in uh, everything in place, you know, managing correctly the classes and also the gaps in progress, then usually they start getting much more involved with other type of activities. In my case, I've been working with different students uh, in the past, not just during the capstone, but also those that just as volunteer want to want to do something in one of the projects that I run, for instance, with small firms in, in developing countries. And uh, the students uh, take part, they actually analyze data, you know, make contributions in different dashboards, work with also other faculty or, or companies or students from the from the from different regions, in this case from Latin America. So those activities are just extra. And, and the students are, have been extremely active in the past doing things like that. I know similar things like just in the in the in this uh, past spring, you know, also because of COVID, plenty of students took part also of the of the short projects we call it. So it's it's like an independent study, but actually students were able to work on projects with also UNICEF and other uh, organizations related to the responsiveness of of COVID. So when that happened, all the companies were really struggling, and we actually shaped. Uh, around three or four projects, they probably more, Robert, but you probably know the number better than number, but there were plenty of students that took part of this. What, eight? Okay, eight projects, that's awesome. Eight projects on this, and uh, and at the end, there were students that couldn't really get involved at the end because they were really working with the capstone. So there are plenty of things, right? But the, the initiatives are there. There are also students that after, you know, finishing the, the work, they actually continue working with us. Others just join. So I actually had... Uh, a new art, a, a PhD student that was also an SEM student just one year and a half ago. So those things can happen, right? So there, are, there is plenty of opportunities of engagement. Uh, I'm still, you know, in managing that part or role, as, as Robert said, it is trying to, you know, provide things to the students uh, in a timely manner so that they do not just get in a crisis with all the things that they need to do. And uh, now we know that is a challenging part, but very soon uh, the idea is that we will, we will share also other opportunities uh, for the class to get engaged with, you know, with the different labs and, and different uh, uh, initiatives we have uh, at the center. For now, for sure, the hackathon is going to happen in the in the spring, and, and that's going to be a, a great opportunity for uh, for the students to uh, to engage with industry, but also with alumni, and also work on, on projects uh, shaped and, and and overseen by different uh, researchers and labs uh, from CTL. But we'll talk about that later. So any other difficult question, Robert? Uh, you are muted. Uh, one more question for Namoon and Michelle is, um, are there any um, clubs across MIT that you've joined or associations or other areas um, that you've been involved with? I know you've only been here two months now, so it's still um, getting the ball rolling. Um, any thoughts there? <laughs> Sure. Um, so I, there are many, many clubs to join and there are just so many. Um, it's really a matter of, you know, prioritizing and choosing the ones. So uh, there are a couple of fun clubs, I think, from, and not just within SCM, you can, you know, pick from Sloan or all the other schools on campus. So there, there are a couple of Sloan classes that I have, I'm just a member of, and I, you know, it's mostly Zoom sessions now because of COVID. Uh, there's like a wine club that's kind of interesting and a brewing club if you're into beer brewing. Um, so that's something that I can drop in, you know, every other month and um, meet network with other people, but also, uh, you know, it's a really great de-stressor for sure. Uh, there's, and then on the more serious note, uh, there are many women specific organizations that I've been following, um, not necessarily been very active with yet. Uh, there's one called the Graduate Student Women's Organization that actually one of our classmates, Lipsy, um, is a, I think, a chair at this year. Um, and she's been sort of the, the person that has been plugging us into their events. And there are loads of events that are, you know, tailored towards uh, women in graduate school that, um, that we're invited to. And I've attended one. Um, and that has been really lovely. Again, just the networking piece, but also um, kind of that piece of getting, you know, a different side of graduate school, not just focused on supply chain, but also other parts of it, you know, again, career building, um, uh, learning a little bit more about how to best design a happy life. I think that was the, the workshop, um, the topic. And so again, lots of different things. Uh, of course, um, organizations around like music and sports 
unfortunately are not active at the moment, but I'm sure it would be slowly active once um, COVID does <laughs> uh, die down a little bit and, get, and gets better. So there are many opportunities. Michelle? I couldn't have said it better. So I think we can, yeah, leave. Uh, no one yeah. said the, the <laughs> chess club, Michelle. You, should, you are part of the chess club or not? Uh, I, I could I could join. I may I may have to look into that this way. <laughs> oh, actually, I just realized um, our class do have our own. They're not official clubs, but we do have like a tennis uh, yeah. time that everybody goes and plays tennis. So we have these times reserved at the, the tennis court and whoever has time would come and join and play together during that time. So we have these unofficial clubs um, as, a, as a as a program as well. That's great. Um, so yeah, I know we're getting a little uh, over on time. So I just want to answer two questions that I think are most relevant. And as I mentioned in the chat, um, any additional questions, you can feel free to email me at scm.mit.edu. We'll get through to all those questions um, if you send those emails this week. Um, so one question that um, is very relevant is um, if you have the SCM MicroMasters, um, is it advantageous to your application? Um, and the short answer is um, yes, because we can see that you have um, demonstrated your ability in areas of supply chain that are very relevant to us. Uh, this also gives you the opportunity to apply to both the blended or the residential program. Um, if, you, if you choose to apply to the residential program, you can use that credential towards, um, towards um, waiving or opting into different classes as a residential student. Um, you would still be required to fulfill the 90 units of credit, but you have a little bit more flexibility to, to choose um, more electives or other, um, other classes. Um, so it really, it does, it is beneficial um, both for your learning and preparation for the residential program. And another question sort of on that same topic is um, if you have a, a business degree or other graduate degree, um, are you still eligible to apply or does it impact your application at all? At all? Um, you're more than welcome to apply. Um, I think um, we definitely have a lot of applicants who have a prior degree, either um, an MBA or a master's of um, science elsewhere. Um, so you can definitely take that into consideration and still apply to the to our program here. Um, you may just want to be, um, you can explain in your statement of objectives just how you see the our degree here at MIT impacting your career and how you'll use that um, different from your MBA, but um, it's definitely an option um, to apply and we'll definitely review your applications um, for both if you have that degree. So maybe maybe uh, final questions for Namun and Michelle, right? I like actually that last question. So it says, what is the most important tip that you wish you that you had prior to the enrollment? This is this is a tough one, but I'll uh, I'll take a stab at it. So, I think the thing that um, probably surprised me the most uh, was how quickly we hit the ground running. Just from the perspective of academically during orientation, that you are, you know, already looking at coding and statistics. And if you haven't looked at it since you took, uh, you know, SC0X, then maybe good even to do a little brief refresher before orientation. Um, but that was definitely one surprise, just how quickly we hit the ground running. But, you know, on kind of the, the same other side of the coin, um, I was also very pleasantly surprised that even with, you know, the you know, intense academic environment that we're in, um, you can totally rely on your classmates to work with you if you, you know, maybe somebody has an area that they don't understand as well. Um, somebody else in the class, you know, very, very likely is able to understand better. And people are so willing from, from day one uh, to go above and beyond to help out their classmates. Um, so yeah, that that's what I would say. No, I agree, actually. Um, I, I can't really think of a, a really another good example in terms of you know, what I wish I had known. Um, the, the planning piece is really key. You know, you do hit the ground running like as soon as you <laughs> arrive. And I, so I think really do spend, you know, the, the months or weeks before coming, um, preparing, you know, whether it's through those SC0X courses, um, thinking through your stories and your narrative, um, really spending time reflecting on what you should be prioritizing, like what you want to get out of this program and what your next steps would be after the program. Um, and so I think 
getting those stories straight with yourself and those priorities straight with yourself in the beginning would be really helpful. Now with just classes and you know ranking capstone projects or um, ranking classes and choosing electives, but also in terms of recruitment and the types of companies that you end up applying to, because everything starts basically in, in the fall. And so the sooner you have a better understanding of what you want and what you want to get out of the program, the better. Awesome. That was great. Thank you so much. It's a very interesting uh, answer and makes us also think about it. But that makes total sense. I mean, you start the program starts extremely quickly and and yeah, you guys are really required to start really coding and doing statistics and working on different things. So this also says, uh, you know, sets the tone for those that are interested in, in applying. Um, this is part also of the expectations and all the work that you could you could do the pre-work before applying to get more familiar with this, get the SC0X, start taking your, your intro to Python course. That will be extremely helpful later for, for the program. This is what I'm also getting. So this is, uh, this is great. Uh, there are other questions I see, but uh, we definitely are already, you know, running out of time. But as Robert said, uh, please reach out to us. Let me just share the final uh, slide that shows also the, the website and, of course, the, the email that uh, Robert have, have, has been referring to, the scm at mit.edu. Uh, just write there. And uh, if you also want to reach out to Michelle and Amun, we can also share the contact uh, through this email. Uh, and, and you can also, because I, I saw some questions related to the scholarship or the awesome, things like that, that's totally fine. Feel free to reach out to the, of course, I, I hope that you guys are also looking forward to receiving this, this, these questions and communication. But for the rest, uh, uh, Robert is the best person. And I also receive a copy of those emails. And if in some moment there is something you also want to know uh, uh, that, I, that I could share, feel free also to reach out to, to me. So Robert, anything else that I'm missing? No, that's great. Uh, I think with that, we'll wrap it up. And like I said, we'll um, be happy to respond to any emails. Um, thanks in advance for staying with us um, and joining this webinar. And we will be in touch and we look forward to reviewing your applications um, in, the, in the coming months. <laughs> thanks again. Thank you. Thank you all. And thank you, Michelle. Thank, thank you, you Namun.